Good morning, everybody. This morning, during the intercession, we're going to be doing a piece that has been in, that's in the uh, Then Let Us Sing sampler, and it's called Anointing Fall on Me. Now, if you care to look at the screen, uh, you'll see how we're going to do this. And what happens is we will have, we will introduce singing this twice, then we will have an intercession, we will sing this twice, we have another intercession and we sing this twice, and then after the third one, you will see this, and we do let the power of the Holy Ghost fall on me, we do that three times. So, what we're going to do right now is we are going to sing it through. We're going to do the first set, this one. We're going to do this in a set. We're going to sing it two times. We'll sing that there, anointing follow me, anointing follow me. Then we're going to go back and sing that exactly the same thing again. Then after that, we will go and do the third set just to give you an idea. The second time through, it'll give you an idea and join us as uh, you can. We'll all follow the choir. Good morning to you. 
and a warm welcome to St. Matthew's United Church on this uh, last Sunday of the month of October as we move ever closer to the real autumn that we know awaits us at some point. We gather this day for prayer, for contemplation, and, be, and to be together in God's presence. I'm very glad to be able to welcome you this day and also to welcome those who are joining with us in spirit via the live stream. And I hope our service this day will be a time of quiet, but also a time of warmth and joy. We do have a worship and music committee meeting after church. We'll just be meeting right here in the sanctuary for ease of movement. Next Sunday, the session and the official board are going to meet after church. Next Sunday is also Remembrance Sunday. We will be observing Remembrance Day here at St. Matthew's. And the following Sunday, November 4th, we have a congregational meeting following church, and we will get updates from the official board about, among other things, um, our Kindred Works Legacy Project, the, uh, the offering of our property and our building to the common good of the city of Halifax and the ways in which we've been working with Kindred Works Development and with their architects to begin to plan what that might look like on our land. The only other announcement that I have, I have remembered John Nesbitt, is that there are copies of the Good Tidings newsletter from Earth Spirit Action that are at the door if you didn't pick one up last week. Are there other announcements that we ought to hear together in community? Just a reminder as we move into worship that each of us should have a hymn assessment sheet that we can write our comments in about the glory that was anointing, anointing fall on me when we actually get through it. Um, and uh, you, can, you can actually, we've decided, you can actually just hand your sheets back in other than the choir and uh, because they're not personal. So we'll just hand them back out each week and then we can just fill them in each week. In the absence of other announcements, let us invite God's presence into our midst. Let us feel God's Holy Spirit as we join together in our opening words. And I invite you to speak the words in italics. Let us pray. We gather this day, O oh God, on this land we share with the Mi'kmaq Nation under treaties of peace and friendship to be strengthened and comforted by your presence as we pray for peace. As we offer ourselves and our gifts to caring for creation and our neighbor and to building justice and reconciliation, fill us, we pray, with wisdom and compassion, grace and love. Amen. As God's beloved people, we gather together in community, and I invite you to turn to one another and greet one another with signs of peace, mindful that for some of us, COVID hovers. The peace of Christ be with you.
Will you join with me in singing our opening hymn this morning, I, the Lord of Sea and Sky. Here I am, Lord. It's at number 509 in Voices United, but the lyrics will also be on the screen. Amen. Please be seated. Our scripture reading this morning 
is taken from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, reading at the 22nd chapter and beginning at verse 34. Jesus and his disciples have come to the temple in Jerusalem, where great crowds have gathered to hear him, and many have also come to challenge him. Verse 34. Now when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked Jesus a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The word of God. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. God of grace, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Do you have a preferred learning style? Like most other labeling, the notion of having a preferred learning style is far more useful if we see it as offering us insight into what works best for us and why, rather than grabbing onto it as justification for limiting ourselves. But as long as we keep that in mind, it can be rather interesting to consider for ourselves what's the best way in which we take new information on board. It's rarely unilateral. But as humans, we can learn visually by seeing, by hearing, and by doing, in some combination of the three. And for each of us, whatever it is that we're trying to learn, there's probably a way we find it easiest. And probably also a way that just really doesn't work as well for us. But of course, no one way of learning is best. And no one way of learning is complete. It looks like a moment of learning. This moment we hear about in our passage today that Deneen read for us from the Gospel of Matthew. But it turns out to be less a moment of learning than a moment of testing. Jesus is still in the temple in Jerusalem. He's surrounded by his disciples and others. And this is late in his story. This is close to his death. And he himself has been preaching and teaching. But in this particular moment, he's being set up for a test by one of the Pharisees faithful leaders of the Jewish community, but by one in particular who's described here, identified here as a lawyer. Which, when we hear the word lawyer, we think of someone who's learned in civil law or criminal law or family law. But in Jesus' time and in his Jewish community, a lawyer would be what we might think of as a theologian because a lawyer would be an expert in the law of Moses, in the Torah, in the books of the Bible. A lawyer would basically be, in the context of the Jewish community that Jesus is part of, a scholar of the Bible, biblical law. The commandments and the teaching received from God through Moses and the prophets and collected into what we would call the Older Testament. So he's basically a biblical scholar, a theologian, this lawyer. And he sets Jesus up here not for a moment of learning from Jesus, but for a test. Because of all the commandments, he asked Jesus, of all the commandments, which is the most important? And it might initially sound to us like he's trying to learn something, this lawyer, like he's trying to learn from Jesus which commandment Jesus thinks is the most important, and then he'll sort of incorporate that into his own contemplations. But that is very much not his point here. His point is just to trap Jesus into identifying just one commandment as being the most important because then he can imply that Jesus clearly thinks all the rest of the commandments are also rams, second best, which would be a very wrong thing indeed. And then, haha, on Jesus, he has been got. But of course, that's not how it plays out. Jesus eludes this lawyer's trickery, not only by answering with not the one, but the two greatest commandments, but even more importantly, what Jesus leaves unspoken is the words that precede what will be his answer from the book of Deuteronomy, from the law of Moses. 
because he knows his listeners will hear them anyway in the back of their mind. It's what's called the Shema, because that's the first word in the phrase. It's a bit like we might refer to the Lord's Prayer as the Our Father, because that's how it starts. Shema Yisrael, hear, O Israel. The Lord thy God, the Lord is one. For faithful Jews, like Jesus, like the Pharisees, like this lawyer, these are the central, deepest, grounding words. They're about identity. They're the opening of morning prayers and evening prayers. They're at the heart of all of it. They're literally written on the doorposts. A faithful Jew affixes a tiny box to the doorpost of his home. And inside is a little scroll, and on it is written that verse, Shema Yisrael, hear, O Israel. The Lord thy God, the Lord is one. Jesus doesn't have to say those words because they've been absorbed as identity by his listeners. They hear them in the back of their minds already. They're heard already in what comes next. The first great commandment. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your strength and with all your mind. And then the second follow-up, so he can't be accused of choosing just one, clever Jesus, and your neighbor as yourself. It's clever, but it's also meaningful. Because what Jesus is asked for by this lawyer is a commandment, like a rule made of words to be read and then memorized and then followed. But what he answers with instead is an identity, an identity that gets absorbed, not just by reading, but also by hearing, by watching, by doing, until it becomes a way of being. It's interesting to me that when Mark tells this story in his gospel, the lawyer who challenges Jesus actually thanks him for his response. Like, wow, teacher, you're so right. You've put it perfectly. In Matthew's gospel, we don't get that nice ending, but presumably it happened because Jesus is so right and he has put it perfectly because I don't know that any of us would be able to say that at some level our sense of feeling connected to Godness, however we might think about that and how that shapes a way of being, I don't know that any of us would be able to say that that hasn't somehow fundamentally been absorbed. Maybe in our home of origin, maybe via experiences since, maybe mysteriously in the midst of some kind of major life change, maybe we, because we found ourselves making ourselves deliberately ready or deliberately open or deliberately attentive. To some degree, that sense of connectedness has been absorbed. It's become identity. It's not been a, a matter of reading about it and memorizing and following a series of directions. It's not been a matter of listening to a lecture about the three great philosophical proofs of God's existence and processing what one's heard and coming up with a choice. It's not been a matter of sitting in a pew and learning to pop up periodically to sing. It might be all of these, but it's more than these. A tiny child being read a Bible story doesn't start understanding God loves them from the words. They absorb it from the arms that are around them and the lap they're sitting on. We don't learn we're not alone from the minister rattling on about it endlessly on a Sunday morning. We absorb it when we walk on a beach and the ocean that is manifestly just a bunch of water somehow gives us strength. And no one learns that they matter in community from sitting on a pew week after week. 
they absorb it from finding out there is a place in that pew for them. And then some. So never mind, Jesus essentially says to the tricky, tricky lawyer in this situation, what's the greatest commandment? Like it's about reading or hearing or memorizing or even practicing, and that's how it's learned, like it's a thing and now you follow it. Here is an identity, he says instead, of being loved and loving that you just get to absorb. And maybe you've been absorbing it your whole life, and lucky you, or maybe you just started now, and lucky you, because it's an identity that just becomes a way. And what could be simpler? It's kind of ironic that what we actually find most difficult to deal with is that simplicity. Be loved and loving. Because our instinct is always to want that identity to somehow be predicated on the object of our love's personality traits. Pop culture is full of the mantra of, I can't love others until I truly love myself. And we regularly do battle with the notion of love thy neighbor, like it still has to count as a commandment, really, when it comes to people that are truly terrible. Our instinct is to want that identity we're being invited to absorb, the identity of being loved and loving. Our instinct is to want it to be predicated on personality. How can I be loved? How can I love myself? when I'm so imperfect and frankly unappealing in so many ways? How can I love that neighbor when they're so dreadful, when they're so wrong? Our instinct is to need the loving we do to somehow be deserved. But it just isn't that complicated. It's predicated on nothing more than our humanness the love that Jesus is quoting from the Hebrew scriptures here, the love that Jesus is talking about in the temple in Jerusalem with all these listeners, it's love as God simply wanting for us and us simply wanting for each other, fullness of life. It's that huge Hebrew word shalom that we so often just translate as peace when what it actually encompasses is the four pillars of fullness of life, food, water, shelter, and well-being. Just by virtue of our humanness, God wants these for us, food, water, shelter, and well-being. That's us being loved. And loving ourselves is just us chiming in, claiming that identity of being loved fiercely enough that if a world of broken systems is withholding from us fullness of life, food, water, shelter, well-being, we'll know that's simply wrong. And we'll say, hey, I know what I deserve because I'm loved. But that's why this identity of being loved and loving can't be separated from all of us being neighbors to each other. Because it's hard to demand food, water, shelter, well-being from a wrong world of broken systems when we don't have food, water, shelter, well-being. We need neighbors who love us, who want that fullness of life for us. And they demand it of a world of broken systems on our behalf as we do for them when the situation is reversed. That's what there is here in this identity of being loved and loving. It's not about assessing personality or actions. There's no expectation that we need to ante up with uncritical cuddling or unilateral respect for what's patently not respectable. It's about being a human family for whom God wants shalom, food, 
shelter, water, well-being. And to whom God entrusts its securing for each other. It's about an identity of essential connectedness and mutual responsibility. These aren't commandments we learn, read, memorize, follow, that Jesus gives us here. They're an identity we absorb, being loved, that becomes for us a way, being loving, looking out for each other, feeling responsible for each other, praying for each other. No learning styles necessary. Just breathe. Breathe in, being loved. Breathe out, being loving. Because my yoke is easy, Jesus says to us, and my burden is light. Thanks be to God. Amen. Will you join with me in singing our hymn, which is at number 297 in Voices United, All Praise to You. The lyrics will be on the screen.
Please be seated. Gathering ourselves together in community, we offer to God our prayers. And we'll follow along in the choir in singing our response. Let us pray. Dear God, we rest in your presence. We lean into your comfort. We lift all our prayers for the world and for peace. We pray for a ceasefire in Gaza, for Palestinians and as, as Israelis in mourning, for an end to terrorism and retaliation and for compassion and wisdom in these fraught times. Holy One, we pray for our neighbors, near and far, for all who've contended with floods and fires, for all still contending with drought. This day we pray for our neighbors in Maine as they lean on one another in a grief and pain we know too well. We pray for all who have no shelter, for all who are hungry, for all bearing the pain of illness and infirmity, for all living with trauma and addiction, and for compassion and wisdom in our care for one another.
God of grace, hear our prayers for all in need of comfort and strength. For those who are dearest to us and for ourselves, guide us in your way. Give us courage on the road ahead. And let your Holy Spirit fall upon us, anointing us with the gifts of hope and compassion and wisdom as we pray as one community of faith. who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. Will you join with me in singing our closing hymn this morning, number 687 in Voices United, When Will People Cease Their Fighting?
Now let us go out into the newness of this day and the newness of this week to seek justice and to love kindness and to travel humbly with one another in God's path. And let us go out knowing that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of God's Holy Spirit rest within us, surround us, and lift us up this day and always. Amen.